Dear friends and colleagues, good afternoon. I'd like to offer my utmost thanks to the Carlsberg Foundation for the invitation to present our research at this conference. Thank you very much for financing our research and fieldwork since 2004. We have worked under the Danish Institute at Athens in excellent collaboration with the effort of underwater antiquities and the 26th effort of prehistoric and classical antiquities, and I wish to thank for Dr. Simosi for all her help and support. Also today I'm glad to see uh, four former team members of the Sea Harbor Project, Tol, Søren, Sen and Nils, here today, so we must be doing something right, at least aspects of it. And I'm also very happy to see uh, Dr. Kisas here, who is a very important scholar in the Corinthia, where we are now working. Athens in the 5th and 4th century BC was preeminent because of her naval power and with the navy's importance came that of her harbor city, the Piraeus, where naval bases housed hundreds of triremes that served as the primary arm of Athenian power. The architectural glories of the Acropolis stood in second place to her naval bases according to an unknown Athenian writer who wrote, O Athens, queen of all cities, how fair your naval base, how fair your Parthenon, how fair your Piraeus. As early as the late 6th or early 5th century BC, the city had learned that maintaining a huge fleet entailed a substantial investment in coastal structures to protect and maintain each ship. When they were not at sea, triremes required dry storage out of the water to prevent their hulls from being consumed by wood-eating marine worms, and they required covered shelter to fend off the fierce heat of the Mediterranean sun, which over time dried and shrank hull timbers, and in doing so caused leaks. Mediterranean winters could also cause damage as rainwater caused timber swelling and fungal decay. Without protective measures, a fleet would be rendered useless in a relatively short period of time. The solution to prevent all this was the shipshed. In the Piraeus, shipsheds were long parallel structures consisting of ramps that sloped up and away from the water's edge and side passages on each side of the ramp for hauling and maintenance crews. They were covered by a monumental superstructure made up of stone colonnades, walls, and tile rules, all of which provided shade, ventilation, and protection. During Athens' naval career, the city built shipshed complexes in the free harbors of the Piraeus in Cantharos, which also served as Athens' commercial harbor, and in the smaller harbors of Sea and Munichia. These later two became exclusively dedicated as naval harbors. By the late 330s BC, these free harbors could house 372 triremes. The shipsheds covered an area in the region of 110,000 square meters, and it is no exaggeration to state that the shipshed complexes in the Piraeus are among the largest roof structures of antiquity. This image shows an artistic reconstruction of the Munichia harbor fortifications and shipsheds as they would have appeared in the classical period. We have also conducted excavations on the harbor fortification, but the main focus here will be the group one shipsheds in the northern side of the harbor. I mean, that's the right hand side on the screen. The shipsheds were discovered in this area of the modern harbor, and I have included the following video clip in order to introduce you to the extreme working condition in the Piraeus. Keep in mind that we are working in very polluted water. I'll just turn that down a little sound. Whoopsie. Here we see the divers arriving uh, to the area under excavation. In the background, you can see Fela getting the water pump ready. It's uh, quite a big logistical adventure to do underwater archaeology. You can see Yanis Sabudis getting ready and getting into the water. 
Note that he's wearing a chemical resistant uh, diving suit and a full face mask. You can see him hooking up to the communication cable, which is also the lifeline. The visibility is so bad that sometimes you can only see 20 to 30 centimeters. Therefore, it is essential that you can communicate to the surface and to, uh, to the people that you're diving with. Here they're running the communication check to the surface and then the divers communicate to each other. We use dredges, which are basically big underwater vacuum cleaners. You see it here being positioned in the area to be excavated. As you can see, visibility is not great. These uh, dredges are run by uh, water pumps, which are standing on, uh, on the shore or on a platform, as you saw. Good. And you can hardly see the diver. We have actually turned up the contrast to see it. Here we go along a very important side wall, which I'll talk about in a second. And you can see uh, slowly appearing Vasilis is uh, excavating a piece of wood in the ramp foundations of, uh, of a ship shed. Again, the diver is completely sealed from the contaminated uh, environment. Good. Good. A large area of the Group 1 ship sheds extend for a distance of 33.6 meters from the modern harbor front and to a depth of 1 meter 95. Note that the modern harbor front itself is built around 11 meters into the sea and therefore Shipshed 1 extend about 45 meters into the sea from the actual shoreline. The 6.2 meter wide Shipsheds are monumental in size and construction. The side wall here is 1.6 meters wide and individual column bases measures 1.6 by 1.6 meters. Here you see one of the column bases. Excavations revealed that the colonnades are standing on a foundation fill. Based on pottery excavated in a close context within the foundation fill of the colonnade, dividing shipshed 1 and 2, and in the ramp of shipshed 1, these shipsheds are dated with a terminus postquem of 420 to 480 BC, a date that is supported by the C14 carbon dating of a work piece of wood found in the foundation of the colonnade dividing shipsheds one and two. This is the earliest archaeological evidence of naval installations in the Piraeus. Here we see the pottery in question, two lecanae. Lecanae was very common household vessels in Athens in the late 6th and 5th century BC and they account for significantly large percentage of pottery found both in the Athenian Agora and in the two harbors at Sea and Municha. These shipsheds were built in the years of the young Athenian democracy and it is an inciting thought that some of the Athenian triremes that fought against the Persians at Salamis in 480 BC and saved Athens and the rest of Greece from Persian rule were most probably housed in these shipsheds. Keep in mind that all social classes rode and fought aboard Triremus in the Battle of Salamis. I strongly believe that this pivotal battle created an immensely strong bond among most of the citizens and in this way the Athenian navy was to develop into the backbone of the world's first democracy. What we have been excavating in essence are the material remains of that extraordinary historical development. I'd like to tempt you with uh, our most exciting, exciting discovery at Le Cayenne, well-preserved wooden caissons. These structures caught everyone off guard. I have to admit that the caissons and their preservation surprised us. The wooden caissons, seen here in an artistic reconstruction, 
acted as single mission barges built for the express purpose of being sunk together with the hydraulic concrete cargoes, all of which were designed to form a solid foundation to hold back the force of the sea along this highly exposed stretch of coast. These are the first of their kind ever discovered in Greece with their wooden elements still preserved. But let's get our bearings first. Lycaon was the main harbor of ancient Corinth, and today its ruins lie nearly untouched, both those on land and those that are now submerged as a result of geological activity. Corinth ranked among the most economically and militarily powerful and enduring cities of antiquity. The city lay with an exceptional geographic advantage on the northeastern tip of the Peloponnese and controlled the isthmus that facilitated land travel between northern and southern Greece and travel by sea between the western and eastern Mediterranean. Corinth, which lay some three kilometers from the sea, built on this natural advantage by constructing two harbor towns, the main harbor Lycaon on the Corinthian Gulf to the west and Kenkere on the Saronic Gulf to the east. According to ancient sources, most of the city's wealth derived from the maritime trade that passed through her two harbors. I'd just uh, like to mention here that uh, this, our new project, Lechaian Harbor project, is financed uh, by the Karlsberg Foundation and by the Augustinus Foundation. But let's, uh, let's return to the wooden caissons. Here we are flying over a mole. You can see Vasily is photographing. Yanis Sapodis excavating. This is the fill between two caissons. And you can see they filled it in with pebbles. And you can also see that we have much better working conditions here. The equipment load here is only about 20 ki kilos, where this was 45. And to show that we're not only finding uh, big organic uh, structures, we're also finding olive pits. So. Here we see Mete. When we get down to the wood, of course, it's uh, if we get into the detail work, and that really slows things down, as you can see. Also, we have a conservator specialized in waterlogged wood uh, monitoring uh, all the time. And we also have to monitor the weather at all times, because if the weather picks up, we have to preserve these structures, and we have to protect them with sandbags and geotextile so that they don't get uh, destroyed uh, in the surf. And when you look at the preservation of the wood here, which is at least uh, 1,600 years old. Imagine the potential of finding other organic material from the Roman and the Greek and the Roman period. It's uh, quite mind-blowing. Here we have a zoom out from our drone, where you can clearly see the mole running into the sea. Here I'll only present the wooden caissons from area two, and although they represent our most important discovery to date, I wish to note that in the period of 2013 to 15, we have already documented about 3,000 square meters of other ancient harbor structures. Furthermore, we have also located several caissons in another area of the outer harbor. The wooden caissons form a 58 meter long and 13 meter wide mole. I mean, that's how far we have traced it until now. It may very well continue both seawards and landwards. The southwestern part of Caisson 5 is comprised of parallel supporting beams, a massive perpendicular supporting beam, 
and perpendicular floor planes. Here you see the northern side of Cason 5. The side planks are held in place by vertical posts and around the bottom of ca the Cason, a massive beam strengthen it. And here, D, here the scientific drawing, the section drawing of the northern side. The Cason is tipping towards the east, either because of erosion or perhaps something went wrong when it was placed. In this slide, you see the western side of Cason 5. The second to last post to the south was loose and it was raised by our conservator. This revealed that the posts were attached with large iron nails from the inside. A, prelim a preliminary C14 carbon date placed the caissons in the time frame of the 180 meter long Leonidas Basilica, the largest Christian church of its time. The construction of this monumental basilica began in the middle of the 5th century AD. It is possible that the construction of this immense basilica coincided with renewed buildup of the harbor, thereby facilitating the arrivals and departures of visitors and pilgrims. This is just one of the many questions that we hope to answer in the coming seasons as underwater excavations continue. Scholars have generally assumed that harbor facilities in the Mediterranean were built in the Greek and Roman period then simply repaired and maintained during the Byzantine period. And we actually also find this at, uh, at Lycaon. The discovery of the mole constructed of wooden caissons challenges this picture. The mole is a rare example of major harbor construction in this later era, but it may be indicative of a larger pattern of more ambitious harbor construction in this period such as the Theodosian Harbour at Constantinople, which has recently been excavated. At all events, the benefit of these innovations lasted only a century or two, as Lycaon and its basilica were destroyed by a massive earthquake in the late 6th or early 7th century AD. We do 15 to 25 scientific and public lectures every day. This photo is from my favorite uh, lecture at the New Casper Glyptotech uh, back in 2009 with 330 paying guests. We also lecture at schools in Greece and, uh, and in the Corinth area as it is important for us to, uh, to get the knowledge out in the local, uh, in the local uh, milieu as well. The work of the Sea Harbour project has been displayed at four exhibitions. The latest was held at the Hellenic Maritime Museum. The movie that we did for this exhibition is now a part of the school curriculum in Greece. It's, uh, it's my uh, a bit romantic uh, conception of the Battle of Salamis, but it's, it's factual at least. So we are also involved in the site preservation in the Piraeus and in the presentation of, uh, of the site. The site, based on our results, has been, um, been declared an archaeological site. And there will be uh, this uh, presentation plan coming up where lights and uh, signs will be put up on the harbor front in the eastern part of Sia. So, uh, and there are, we also been, are going to be included in the new underwater museum, which are going to build in the Piraeus. A lot is happening in the Piraeus now, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of momentum, and more important, there's also the money to do it. So I'd say we, we have worked in Greece for a long time, and uh, for the last 15, 16 years. And what I really liked is that I, when I went to open this exhibition at the Hellenic Maritime Museum, I took a taxi down there, and the taxi driver, what are you doing in Greece? And I said, I'm an archaeologist. Oh, what are you doing? I'm working in Oh, you're working in the Piraeus. My son is following you on Facebook. Can I have your autograph? So luckily, I had the catalog of uh, the exhibition, so I signed that the first time ever. I have done that as an archaeologist, but uh, it was good. But of course, one of the things we also as researchers in, in the, the 21st century has to do is that that we have to get our results out, not only in the scientific milieu, but also out to the, 
to the to the general public. And we've been lucky at the Sea Harbor project and also at the Lehigh Harbor project now we've just had world coverage of our very nice wooden boxes as we call them. But media exposure is of course important and the Sea Harbor project will be featured in the National Geographic television documentary The Greeks and we see here two-time Emmy Award winner Max Sola, Salomon instructing the team. We were also involved in the fact-finding behind the BBC documentary Building the Ancient City, Athens and Rome. The Sea Harbor Project it fee is featured and it is the first documentary on ancient Athens that places the commercial and naval harbor of the Piraeus at the same historical and archaeological level of importance as the Acropolis, the Agora, the Plux and the Keramikos. This is where the commercial harbor and the naval bases of the Piraeus rightfully belong. And for me, this is the greatest achievement of the Sea Harbor project and the people and institutions that have supported us over the years. Archaeology is a team sport and I'm proud to say that the Lehigh Harbor project and the Sea Harbor project has an extremely experienced and professional staff. Take for example, Mass Müller Nielsen, with more than 3,000 hours of excavating underwater. That's 125 days underwater. The project could not have achieved these, resu these results without them. So, peace, love and archaeology, and thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks to Bjorn for this uh, lecture and the nice movies and music mm. and the messages. Mm. Um, <laughs> questions, comments? There is a question down here. Well, I was just interested in how are you going to preserve these caissons, as you call them, for the posterity? I mean, are you covering them again? Or what do we do? Yeah, what, what, what we are doing, I didn't include that as there's no time, but we have a, a very, very uh, good uh, conservator, Angel Kisisi, who specialized in, uh, in uh, waterlogged wood. Basically, what we do is that the trends that we have uh, excavated we do a build-up of, of sandbags, expensive sandbags in, uh, in geotextile so that we get very close to the side of the caisson, about this much. Then we have geotextile going down in this, this cavity and then we fill it up with the golden sand, as I call it, because it's very expensive. It's uh, the pink silica sand. When it comes underwater, it becomes almost uh, fluid. So that is, that is, so you, and then it is closed, it is soon up. So it lies as a pillow between, uh, between the, the sandbags and the site. And then, of course, the top is covered and the top has to be continuously monitored. But we do hope, uh, we do hope that sometime in, in the future it will be possible to raise a caisson there five by ten meters. So they're not, uh, they're large, but they're not, uh, Super large. So. There's a question over here. Thank you, Lars Holten, Sound and Elia. It was a very interesting paper and fantastic with all this uh, preserved wood. In some of your pictures, I noticed some uh, reconstructed ships in the background, or was it just? Staffage, or was it proper reconstructions of the terrariums, or? Oh, the, I mean, mainly it, it, it did say artistic reconstruction, but when, when you saw through the different uh, time periods, uh, it's our artist, Janis Nakas. He does, uh, he does the drawings, he does dress people from the, for example, from the, from the dress code of the time, and the ships are also based on, uh, on ships that has been uh, has been excavated and illustrated. So okay, but they were they were not functional then, or what? Uh, you the haven't tested them, or what? No, no, not okay. a, not a, not at all. We are we are mainly dealing with the with the naval bases and not as yeah. much as the um, as the ship ship reconstructions. Yeah. I mean, we're dealing with the harbor structures. 
but yeah. maybe you could just tell us briefly about, th there is actually a reconstruction of an ancient trireme in the Piraeus, yeah. the one called Olympias. Yeah, the Olympias trireme reconstruction, it is, it's, it's more called a, a floating hypothesis because it's not actually, it's not actually a reconstruction because in the sense of, uh, of reconstructing something, you're basing it on, uh, on hard evidence. Like for example, if you find, found part of the ship and one of the, I mean, the holy grail of underwater archaeology is to find a trireme, one of the famed warships. Because what we have now, we only have the eyes. Somebody fished two eyes out of the eastern side of the Sea Harbor before we came. Mm. So the ships on your drawings are inspired Artistic. from the... Yeah, from the, they're, they're based on the Olympias reconstruction. Okay. And, and the few ships that you saw in uh, the reconstruction from Lecchio are based on uh, ship types of that yeah. period. So, Well, an obvious question for you would now be, will, after you have found your ship sheds and measured them and everything, would you then come up with a different reconstruction than the, ones, than the one that has been floating around for 20 years, the one you just... About. No, I, uh, I think that uh, John Coates got as close as he could. Unfortunately, he, uh, he died a few years ago, but he was, uh, I think he did an excellent job on it. it. It can be adjusted, but I think without finding an actual trireme, I don't think we'll get much closer. It should be said that John Coates was also, uh, he was also a ship architect. He was actually building, he was the chief naval architect of the British fleet, so he was actually building a uh, building ships that could sail. And uh, the person who's now working with the, with, the, with the trireme reconstruction is the person behind the new trimaran hull. He also says it's hard to adjust the trireme further without any hard evidence. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. I actually think, Bjorn, that if you use 3D modern imaging technology, you may actually be able to come up with a better model. I mean. Uh, I know some people who are really doing these things, so actually if you take what you have right now, I think you could actually try to do better. It may be he's very close, but I think you should not give up. <laughs> it's very expensive. Where will he get the money? <laughs> <laughs> he can send an application. <laughs> we, we're actually thinking of having a look at, uh, at Salem is in 2020 because then it's 2,500 years since the, the Battle of Salem, uh, so we're sort of brewing with that idea. Uh, uh. But I met some research scientists in Moscow, and they are e extremely good at this year, and they are rather inexpensive, so we'll find a way. <laughs> 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 mm. Touché.